as we look at God's Word, and uh, this is an appropriate sermon as we think about the vows uh, our confirmants take and think about the vows we make and, and how we live our Christian life. Uh, we're called to live differently from the world around us, and that's hard. That's a struggle. In 1 Peter 4, Peter writes about this in verses 1 through 6. It's found on page 1078, and I'll read through verse 11, though, as well. Since therefore Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regards to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have a fervent love for one another. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as the ability which God supplies. That in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Please be seated. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, what is your purpose in life? What are you living for? What motivates you at school, at, at work, or, or with your family? Is it self, pleasure, or others? Or is it God's will? Loving Him by obeying Him. See, Jesus boils all of our lives, really, down to two paths. He does it a variety of times, but one of the times he does it in John 6, and he describes it this way. He says, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures into eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. In other words, there are two paths. One path is the way of life in God. The other path is the way of death and going after things that are going to perish. This tells us something too about the Christian life though. That it's a life that is given by God's grace for a purpose. That's, that's why he talks about uh, the Son of Man will give you. He talks about Christ's salvation. It starts with him. But it also tells us our Christian life is more than just being baptized and confirmed or, or making it maybe to some age where you sit back and you coast and you say, well, you know, I, I can now live as I like. No matter our background, when God saved us, it might have been uh, working in us even as a nursing baby, as, as David describes in Psalm 22. It may be after great sins of, uh, of being a, a participant in murder and persecuting the church as Paul was. Either way, though, our purpose is now to live this life for the will of God. And we do that in an unbelieving culture. And the Lord knows that. But how do we do that? Living a holy life is, is not easy. Trying to, to live Christ-like. And then you add into this, and there's a growing sense of that even in our own country. As Christians are being persecuted here in our nation, Christians suffer. They're, they're being ridiculed. They're, they're being outrightly persecuted. Or maybe it's just a struggle with our own flesh. Looking at all the struggles and the trials that we face and wondering, having that question go to our head, is it even worth it to live the Christian life? Peter is writing this for us. He, he's a man, actually, if you remember, even in his Christian life, had great failings, great sins. And he brings us back to the motivations. 
to the motivations that we have to live for our triune God. And he lays out three of them, that, that, that our motivation comes from our God-given position. It, it comes from how our time is short, as well as by what the future holds. And as Christians, out of thankfulness for God's saving grace, first of all, we are to be determined, be determined to live for God instead of sin. That's kind of the overarching theme uh, of this passage. And, and God's word elsewhere makes this clear over and over again. It, it's not about what we think or what we desire. It's about what God says. Jesus even warns us that there's a way that leads to destruction. It's the broad path, the way the world's going. Well, the, the way uh, to salvation is narrow. It's through Christ alone. Christ is warning us. But so often we treat warnings similar to what General Custer did when he was warned not to engage in what became known as the Battle of the Little Bighorn. He was told he was going to be nailed and he went anyway. And the problem is Custer's example is, is more representative to us than we'd like because although we're told things like forsake foolishness and live and go in the way of understanding from Proverbs 9, 6, we find that hard to do, don't we? And knowing God works in us both to will and to do is good pleasure. Knowing God works faith in our hearts by the Spirit. The Christian life, though, is not one of flipping on the autopilot switch. And that's why Peter is, is giving us these three motivations in this call to a life of holiness, living out and out for God every day. And how do we do that in this world? The events of this life are even our, when our own, even our own hearts seem to be working against us. Well, it begins first with living for God because of our God-given position in Christ. Look at verse 1. Verse 1 tells us, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. Peter is using military language here. Get ready for battle. Be prepared. Be ready. Move forward. Move forward with the, with the same attitude of Christ who was resolved to perfectly obey God rather than sin. So much that Jesus suffered to the point of death. Of course, that was also his purpose. But Peter's focusing on the suffering of Christ. He, we can remember that suffering, how he faced the pain of betrayal, false accusation. He faced beating, spitting on, and, and, and abuse of all sorts. And then he faced the pain of the cross. The greatest suffering was the fact that he suffered God's, God the Father's holy wrath against our sin. That's what it took to redeem you and I. And Jesus did that to change our position so that we would no longer be enemies, so that we would no longer be children of wrath, but as the scripture calls us, beloved, forgiven, redeemed, saints in Christ. You think about 1 Corinthians, it, it's using that word saints in Christ even for Christians who had great failings. And to be honest, we all will, because we will not be perfect until we're before the Lord. We'll wrestle with sin. Peter adds in verses 1 and 2, he says, For he who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. What Peter's doing is he's making an argument. He's saying, since the sinless Lord bore our sins on the cross, and since now, after his death and resurrection, he is done with sin and temptation." What Peter's doing here, he's, he, he's saying now we should live differently when we look at that. He, he's really rewording what was said before. Who himself, he wrote this before earlier in 1 Peter, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. What are you living for? What am I living for? Was it a fluke? Would we just find this passage one time in the scripture? No, actually, the Holy Spirit reinforces this. Because in Romans 6, it says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. 
Each one of us have faced sin, even in sin's temptation, even this last week, perhaps even this morning. Can we go by very long without sinning or being tempted? Probably not. And we would like that, that when that temptation comes, that, that we would be more like perhaps the bodies of our dead loved ones behind the church, how they would respond if we went and waved a, a dead ste- or a, a ju- the juiciest steak before them. They're not able to respond. But what happens with us? And, 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 and we might think, well, maybe that's what Paul's saying, that we're dead to sin, that we can't respond. But the reality is, sadly, too often, when sin whispers in our ears, we comply. Peter's reminding we have a different position before God now. We're a child of God. We're made that by the righteous shed blood of Christ. And we have been, and his point is we've been really disconnected. Sin is no longer reigning over us. We've been disconnected from sin's ability to condemn us and master us. Did you know that? Because by nature, our own sinful nature, uh, when we're faced, uh, sin, our sinful nature, in our own sinful nature, we can't say no to sin. It permeates every decision with unbelief. And you might say, well, I've seen people do good things that weren't believers. Yeah, but the scripture also tells us whatever is not of faith is sin. It's not done for God's glory. God condemns it. But now in Christ, when we are faced with with decisions of sin or obedience, God by his Holy Spirit has given us the ability to say no to sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. We forget that, don't we? That's what Peter's telling us. And so we need to focus not on our sin, not, not on that short... Uh, term pleasure and the misery that follows, but we need to focus our eyes, as Scripture also tells us, on Jesus' victory. And that's what Peter's kind of laying out here. He, he's been t- talking about Jesus' victory and now his suffering so that we can think about this and know how to face sin. That's Hebrews 12 talks about this in a very similar way. It says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We're to consider him who endured such hostility from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart in your struggle against sin. It's a struggle. And it's going to be, I'm sorry, and I'm not a prophet, I'm not the son of a prophet, but it's going to be a greater struggle yet, particularly as our, our society is more and more hostile to the gospel. And the more distinct we are, the more we live for Christ, the more distinct and countercultural we are going to become, and Christ calls us to be. And the world's going to look at us and say we're strange. Or he does. How do you deal with that? Well, know who you are. You're in Christ. You're clothed with his righteousness. And Peter is not telling us because of performance that but, but because of what God has done for us. The Holy Spirit that's brought you to faith is also enabling you to live, and I to live, out of gratefulness for the will of God. There's a second motivation, though, too, that, that Peter gives us here. And that's that we're to be determined to live for God instead of sin, because time is short. Look at verse 3 through 4. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in the lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. You know, there's a struggle, and I hear it every once in a while, too. And, and, and a lot of people will say, but pastor, the Bible is so irrelevant now. So out of date. Really? You know, this could have been written yesterday. And I don't mean 2,000 years ago. Because the reality is God's unchangeable word describes what's happening in our society today. 
of sex outside of marriage and parties and, and idolatry. I mean, what, what do people call it? They call it the almighty dollar, right? Isn't that an idol? The idol of stuff. And at the heart of this life is a life, at the heart of all these sins that are laid out here, is a life lived without God for self and pleasure. The question is, are we going to be different? Do unbelievers look at us and see no difference between the way we live and how they live? If that's the case, Christ's name is blasphemy. And I know some people try to justify and say, well, you know, I, I, I do this so I don't look so strange so people might be appealed to Christ. No, Christ says your distinctiveness is what he's going to use to draw people to himself. And you think about it. Which is the strange way of living? Living a life which will kill you of indulgence, alcohol, drugs, immoralities, which, which brings venereal diseases. People don't think that's strange, do they? No, we praise it. We call it gay. We call it happy. We've taken the word that way even. But when someone repents and turns from sin to Christ, they order their life and even Sunday around the Lord. And what happens? People say, those Christians, they've gone off the deep end. Peter says we've spent enough time living that way. He's probably talking to a lot of adult converts. But even in our life, to be honest, we can say that. We've spent enough time living that way. Why? Because the reality is life is short. I'll bring this up in a conversation I had many, many years ago with Albert Camps. And it sticks in my mind, in fact, too. I said, you know, do the days go by fast for you, or do they go by slowly? And he said, he was over 90 years old. He said, they fly by. The longer we live, the shorter we realize this life is. For some, it's shorter than others. We don't know when the Lord's going to call us from this life. One pastor years ago, not too long ago actually, was preaching about God calling him to glory, and he fell down dead right there as he was preaching. We don't know when our life will end. So we can't say someday in the future, I'm going to live, I'll do this for God. Hebrews tells us, today if you'll hear your voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. This is not works righteousness. This is serving the Lord who saved us. And this brief moment is all that you and I have to demonstrate our love for the Lord. It's not some game or something like that to go to. You know, it's, oh, this is the only Super Bowl. This is the only this. This is the only that. We always make that excuse. But this is the only life we have to demonstrate our love for the Lord. Which is more important? What's our priority? You know, and I, I wish, I, I'll admit, I'll, I wish that, that, that the Lord, after bringing us to faith, would make us perfect, never to sin again. It would just be like a switch. <laughs> it would be nice, wouldn't it? But Jesus lets us battle with sin. So he calls, himself, calls us to himself in glory. Because he wants us to learn what repentance means. He wants us and calls us to, to hate sin. To have even our shame of our past drive us more to holiness. To make us grow in awe of his grace to sinners like us. Because he who loved us, or calls us to love him, has loved us first. And we do that because of what he has done for us. And there's only a brief time in life to do it. You see, salvation is not like a, having our ticket uh, for a plane on a trip somewhere. There's an old song. Many of you might remember it. I know kids are listening to some of these songs, and I, I hesitate even to say it because probably the song will stick in your head for after I say this. The Beatles sang it. She's got a ticket to ride, and she don't care. If we don't live striving to put Christ first in everything, we're acting like that line from the song. 
We're not caring about the suffering of Christ for our sins. And we're either backslidden or we have not been reborn, brought to faith. We have no understanding of our sin, no pity, no compassion, no heart for Christ and his suffering for my sins, suffering for your sins. Peter says we can no longer live for the loss of men, but for the will of God. We have to care. We have only a little time to care, to examine our lives, to deal with the sin in our, our lives, to, to make the choice, putting God first before sports, vacation, even family. And yes, people will mock us, they'll make fun of us, they'll even persecute us. In fact, Peter's probably writing this just a couple of years before Nero's severe persecution broke out, of Christians broke out where he was literally lighting up his gardens with Christians dipped in tar. And in fact, Peter himself was murdered by Nero. And that really pushes us to the last motivation that, that Paul, Peter sets before us. Be determined to live for God because of the future God holds out for you. Because of the future. Verse five, 4 through 5 reminds us suffering, mocking, affliction is not an excuse to sin because of what the future holds. We can't sit there and say, well, you know, God owed this to me. Because Peter writes, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. The judgment of God is coming. And you know what? Even unbelievers know that. That's why they go more to the bottle, they go to the drugs. That's, that's why in a quiet room, if you ever thought about it, you don't want to think about your life too much. You want to turn on the radio, you want to turn on the TV. You don't want it quiet because guess what? Our conscience may accuse us. We have sinned against every commandment of God. And Peter, and I know this is a difficult passage and I didn't even read all of it, Peter might be referring to the fact of some idea that, you know, uh, death was the end of everything, and Peter's reminding people the judgment of God is coming. Death does not stop it. But knowing God will judge every thought, word, and deed is also to motivate us to holiness. Be prepared to live that way, no matter how people mock us. Prepare your hearts for that. Think of Tim Tebow. You know, I, I, can, I can, I understand if people argue that he wasn't a great quarterback and things like that. But the biggest part of what he was mocked for was his public profession of faith. He was mocked on Saturday Night Live. When, when he went to play against the Oakland Raiders, they held up signs that were directed at him saying, Welcome to hell. And there's even more extreme suffering. I think it was in the last, uh, last week, maybe just a little bit more, three black churches in the South were burned intentionally last week. Christians right now, and you don't hear about this, Christians are being exterminated in Nigeria right now. There's a genocide for Christians. When has that been on the nightly news? Well, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the news notices it because Jesus takes that personally. We see that as he spoke to Saul. When, when Saul was persecuting the church, Jesus stopped him in his tracks and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? See, Jesus will judge. He will send them into the lake of fire forever. There will be no stopping that torment. And for verse 6, and, and this is kind of the difficult verse, and I don't have time to go through it all, but for those that had the gospel preached, and, and, it's, and the world, it seems, maybe judged them, they died. But, but Peter may be referring to the fact that they have eternal life. They're with Christ. That's your and my future. No matter what the brief years in between hold. This is why looking past this brief, and so I understand too, what's most important is Christ's judgments, not the opinion of men. What Christ says matters most, it counts. This is why looking past this brief life into eternity, to live for God instead of sin is what we're called to do, or to put this life and its trials really in eternal perspective. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, there's this little animal I didn't even know about it until studying for the sermon. Uh, it's called an ermine. It's a small weasel whose fur turns white in the wintertime. And, and interesting enough, God put a desire in this little creature 
to keep its white fur clean. It's a really strong desire. Hunters evidently understood this, and, and I think they're in Scotland and Ireland or in that area. Uh, hunters understood that, and so what they would do is they would find where the ermine had left its hole, and, and then they would put tar or mud around the entrance. And then they would send the dogs out looking for this, because its, it's fur is just very precious fur. And, and the little frightened ermine would, would run to its home, but seeing that dirt, it would rather face the dogs than soil its white fur. For the ermine, purity was more important than life. How about you and I? There's only two ways to live. For God or self, for purity or for sin. And we're not going to learn to do God's will by osmosis, hanging around church or Christians. We have to be brought to repentance and faith. We have to be armed to be determined to be holy, looking to God's word, putting the priority on, on him and nothing else. And doing that even when no one else sees you. In fact, looking at sin as Joseph did when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him to adultery, saying, how can I then do this great wickedness and sin against God? And then he ran from the situation. See, the only way we will grow in this, learning what it means to do the will of God, is by suffering, struggling against sin, and separating from those who would drag us back into it and clinging to Christ, clinging to his word. And we do this because the position God has given us as Christians, we do this, as though, I should say, forgiven at great cost by our suffering Savior, we do this because of the time is short and because what God holds out for you and I in eternity. May God make us intent to do his will in everything. Let's pray. Almighty God and most gracious Heavenly Father, make your word a lamp to our feet and a light to our feet or a lamp to our path and a light to our feet enable us not not only our confirmation but also each one of us to not only believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with the promise that we will be saved but help us to obey all of your commands including that today that we should live not for the lusts of men but for the will of God make us obedient we pray this in Jesus name amen